So, good morning, once again. A couple of new faces here. Would you please give me your name? Uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. You've been practicing here for some time? Uh, no, this is my first time here. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm going to let this be your class. I'm usually not here, so <laughs> I say anything to offend you or scare you off. And the lady in the corner, your name is? Caroline. Karen? Caroline. Caroline. Welcome. Have I met you before? You seem familiar. It's because she's an artist. You're an artist, okay. We were talking about making a familiar strange, just creativity. So, one of the aspects of creativity. So, I'd like to ask you all to turn and face me so we have more of a casual dialogue. And I think we begin with the Dharma opening verse. Right? 
it takes out color. There's no color. And yet, there's something about black and white photography that color photography doesn't have, can't capture. Well, similar that way, uh, Zen is this simplicity. You know, there's a certain simplicity about Zen. And that simplicity has a lot to do with sameness. So, we sit the same way every time, in a retreat, a long retreat especially, or if you go spend like an ongo 90 days somewhere, or if you go on even longer, uh, Hermet, hermetic, her, hermetic type retreats, not hermetic. <laughs> I guess you suck up in some case. Yes, I'm worried. You're encouraged to sit at the same place. You don't move around, try another place, you know, go sit in a corner for a while and then go over here. You just, this is it from here on. Kodo Sawaki Roshi, who was Uchiyama Roshi's teacher, who was Okumura Roshi's teacher, who was one of my teachers, sat in front of this column in the Zendo for his whole career, and he said that was his greatest teacher, that column, the upright column. So the insentient world is part of this teaching. We control the, the environment, the temperature, the light, the color, the simplicity, so that the insentient world isn't giving us anything to think about. We come in here, it's simple. It's the same every time. When you go to Japan, at first, everybody looks the same. And you're, you know, two, two feet above them. You see this head of black hair everywhere. And everybody looks the same. After a couple of weeks, you can see the difference. When you go to a retreat where everybody's in black robes, uh, what stands out is the differences. Everybody's shaved head, black robe, right? 80, 90 people. And you'd think, well, they'll all look the same. Not the way it works. They all look different because they're all dressed the same. The differences stand in their heads are all shaped. The differences stand out. So this is the way same as different words. It's like uh, yin yang, dark and you know, contrast, black and white, and so forth. So here's a, a creative theme. Uh, we just chanted this the way we chanted in uh, Atlanta. Is slightly different. The unsurpassed, profound, and wondrous. Look at the one. Look at this one. While I chant. Okay. There's an exercise for you to do. Look at this one. Look at this one. Okay. If you're not familiar with it, read that while I chant this, listen to this, and look at that. Look and then you'll see the difference. The unsurpassed, profound, and wondrous Dharma is rarely met with even in a hundred thousand million kalpas. Now we can see and hear it, accept and maintain it. May we unfold the meaning of the Tathagata's truth. So there's not much difference there, right? Just a little bit of difference. So this was some translator's choice. That it chose to translate this. Uh, if you look into Fukan Zazengi, the first four lines are something like, when you trace the source of the way, you find that it is universal and absolute. How can it be dependent on practice and enlightenment? The supreme teaching is free, so why study the means to attain it? The way is needless to say, very far from delusion. Why then be concerned with the means of eliminating delusion? And the fourth one is, the way is completely present where you are. And one translation says, so what use the tiptoes of training? What does that mean? Right? What use the tiptoes of training? <laughs> and you look at another translation, it says, what use pursuing practice enlightenment elsewhere? Or one goes so far as to say, what use going to far and dusty lands looking for enlightenment? So you begin to see what this Chinese, ancient Chinese expression, tiptoes of training, means. That's a creative choice on the part of the translator. Right? One is being very literal, translating very literally. The other is translating the meaning of, of what they find. Right? So let's do a little brief uh, uh, verbal exercise that shows you illustrates, it's kind of like a Marshall McLuhan, anybody know Marshall McLuhan? Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message, it did a lot of work on, uh, in the 70s, 80s on television, the impact of television, and how it was a cool medium, and radio is a hot medium, and all these kinds of analyses. And he liked to point out the difference in uh, that cultural inventions of new media make. And every time a new one comes along, everybody says, oh, there's the end, you know, internet, that's the end of books. We have, you know, the, uh, what are the names of the electronic e books? Yeah, e-books and all that. So, there go books. But in every case, the prior medium 
has always evolved into a different niche. And it's, you know, maybe more customized or whatever, but they've survived, but they've changed. <clears throat> so, um, creativity is in, unconsciously influenced by the cultural media in which we are immersed. Now, the only way you get out of that, or one of the ways you can get out of that, is if you go travel to a really remote part of the world where nothing like this exists. And if you do that, you begin to see the difference between the way we live and the way Buddha lived in India. In India, in Buddha's time in India, 2,500 years ago, there were no toilets. There, you know, there was no electricity. There, it's just unbelievable uh, the differences that we take for granted that we don't even know are affecting us. So, uh, when we consider meditation, Zen, and we consider its assimilation into this culture. We have to be careful not to go back and read something from 13th century China, Dogen's teaching. This is a book, a series of books we recommend, especially if you're going to join the Skype conference. Bye. You can download for free Shobo Genzo from Shasta Abbey from other sources. Shobo Genzo means something like the Dharma Treasury of the True. Treasury of True Eye. True Dharma Eye. The tr Treasury of the True Dharma Eye. Well, it's a popular title for books for Dogen and also in China. Um, where was that? You're supposed to keep track. Uh, if you go back to the 13th century. Yeah, the, um, and, and, and you try to extract, very good, <laughs> you try to extract something that Dogen said and say, here's the truth, nothing but the truth, and so forth. And then you see somebody here doing something different. You say, wait a minute, that's wrong. You're supposed to do this. You know? well, you go back to the 13th century and live there for a while and find out why they did it that way, right? Or what was going on. And there's some really absurd uh, instructions Dogen gave to his monks that if we tried to do it today, people would think we were insane. How to go to the toilet, how to take a bath. Huh? <laughs> he, he did have instructions for them not to write on the toilet walls. <laughs> So they had graffiti in the 13th century <laughs> in the monasteries. So was, stuff like that throws a little bucket of cold water on your romantic and mythical ideas. My favorite was no fortune telling in the Zindo. <laughs> <laughs> and then he had another one. It's, in, uh, it's actually in this. It's uh, the Rules of the Cloud Hall. He's got all these rules. And one is, uh, do not come into the Zindo smelling of wine. But if you do, <laughs> you have to give up one talent of lamp oil for reading at night. <coughs> so there are penalties. So it kind of gives you the idea of the roughnecks he was dealing with. So here's another exercise that gives you a little insight into the impact of media. And particularly the printed words that the uh, Gutenberg Press that uh, McLuhan talked about a lot and about the impact it had. We're going to chant something, and it's going to be done in oral tradition. Meaning, you don't have anything to look at. You have to listen to what I say, and you say it as soon as you can to stay with me. It's not call-response. I don't say a line and then wait for you to say the line. I'll say the first line twice. <laughs> Give you a little chance to catch up, okay? And then we'll go from there. <clears throat> so this is a, a brief one. We don't have a whole lot of time today. This is uh, Dogen Zazen Shin. Zazen Shin means acupuncture acupuncture needle for Zazen. Uh, it means the sharpest point, right? And it's going right to the point of the matter of our uh, Zazen, which means Zen meditation, sitting in Zen. So the central function of Buddhas, the central function of Buddhas, the functioning essence of ancestors, actualized within non-thinking, manifested within non-interaction, actualized within non-thinking, the actualization is by nature intimate. Manifested within non-interacting, manifestation is itself verification. Actualization by nature intimate never has defilement. Manifestation that is by nature verification never has distinction between absolute and relative. Intimacy without defilement is dropping off without relying on anything. 
verification yes. beyond yes. distinction yes. between absolute and relative yes. is making effort without aiming at it. The water is clear to the earth, a fish is swimming like a fish. The sky is vast and extends to the heavens, a bird is flying like a bird. Now, this is a poem, and it was written in China. And then Dogen wrote it, and when he rewrote it, he changed its meaning. Still called Zazen in China, Zazen Shin in China, an old Chinese master in his. Want to do it again? We don't have time. <laughs> <coughs> but if we did that again and again and again and again and again, pretty soon we'd all be together, be one voice. And if I get hit by a truck, somebody else would get it. Well, this is the way the teaching started in India. Uh, Buddha died, but his cousin, Ananda, was said to have had an eidetic, it's called eidetic memory. He could remember everything Buddha said. That would be horrible if you think about it. I mean, yeah, and uh, because of that, he, he could not become enlightened under Buddha because he was too dependent upon Buddha being alive and his teaching. You know, it was, uh, it was a cold dependency. After Buddha died and Kashyapa had become the leader, Ananda became enlightened under Kashyapa and was the third or the second patriarch after, after uh, Kashyapa. And Buddha himself was not considered a patriarch because he was the founder. <clears throat> and there are matriarchs too. Don't get us, don't get us into that here. <laughs> so, um, our dependency upon the printed word means that we don't have to listen. You know, those days you had to go wherever somebody was teaching and you had to go and listen or you couldn't hear this. You couldn't get at it. You couldn't get the teaching. And then in order to know the teaching, you had to memorize it. And the only way you could memorize it was by chanting along with those who knew it. So this is how the order became what it was in group. In Buddha's lifetime, it was all men, and then toward the end of his life, they had a council and they included women. Hmm. Yeah. It probably caused a lot of trouble. <laughs> For the people who should be in trouble. And uh, the concept of the Sangha opened to embrace uh, all sentient beings. And ultimately, Buddha nature is the whole universe. So, very expensive concept. But imagine what that is like. They didn't write these words down for some 400 years, the story goes, because they considered them too sacred. If you think about that for a minute, you can see that if you do write them down, somebody can mess with them. Somebody can change them. You know? And if you if you write them down, and I come and listen to you give your lecture, you know, and most of these lectures these days are for the purpose of selling the book, right? So if you come and listen to me, I might do a few readings. But what I'm trying to get you to do is go buy this book, because that's how I make my living or income. Right? In those days, one like that. You had to go listen to that person and to participate for many, many, many repetitions because Buddha was a blabbermouth. I mean, he, he was a talker. Talk, 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 talk. He was trying to teach to hundreds, maybe thousands of people over 50 years. So that's a lot of teaching. Right? And he, you're, you're sure he was out there every day. He started reading. So, let's stop there for a minute, see if anybody has any questions about that. Uh, we lost something very profound when we got the printed word. Probably even when we got the written word. And in, in uh, the days of Buddha, they had written language. Sanskrit was a written language. It was the court legal language, and it was used for records keeping and stuff like that. But he spoke Pali, and uh, we'll do the Tisaran in Pali to illustrate that a little bit later, and a creative approach to it. So, comments, questions? Let's, yes, you're, you should be first questioner. So. Uh, spoken word to written word. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the amazing opportunity to uh, give birth to a brain injured child mm -hmm. uh, who pretty much has no left hemisphere, so he's completely right brain. Uh, and I had to make a decision, and it was a difficult one. 
was I going to teach him to speak? And I chose to do that because I decided that since he had been manifested in human form, that that was maybe necessary. Uh, once he acquired words, his intuition took a, went way back. The kindness and the compassion were still there. Uh, but I could be thinking something and he'd know it prior to mm -hmm. his trying so to... So the problem with teaching him words is it, it uh, inhibited the intuitive? Yeah. yeah. It was fascinating. Well, it's one of the Zen principles is we label things, we think in words, right? And then we think that's the only way to think. Einstein proves it's wrong. Um, then we think uh, that the labels we have, the words we have, actually represent the truth. And as we said yesterday, if you just say elephant enough times, you'll find out it doesn't have any connection. Right? Oh, yeah. First French fry he ever had was a skinny French fry. Mm -hmm. That was a French fry. The next one he had was a crinkle cut, and he wouldn't eat it because it wasn't a French fry. Wasn't a French fry. So words yeah. are very powerful. See the limitation. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, well, let's go back to what we said. Where did we leave off, and what did you have any remainders left from our discussion yesterday that you'd like to bring up, or anything that occurred to you? I meant to ask each of you to compose a hike, you know, five, seven, five syllable so poem. So, for the rest of the discussion, why don't you do that, and then we'll listen to them at the end of the talk. Okay. okay. I'll bank one up too. It's easy. I did that during the first period. Okay, so you got one. Okay, I could avoid it. Okay. I didn't want to get it to you before as I was in, because then you're sitting there and you're, like, and you're not supposed to be thinking about it. Okay. That's my fault. It's my bad. So you're ready. Do you have any comment from yesterday? Um, no, I, I don't think I have. I think I know. Corey? Um, nothing right now. <coughs> Uh, I have a comment. A, a part of in talking about the uh, creative experience um, and for me the medium and how that's expressed is where it ties in for me is part of my so coming to practice is what I got into about trying to make it permanent. And so then I found out that trying to make you create a mind runner or practice. Well, try to make what I what was present mm. more permanent. Mm. And then I had experience with paper because of the paper to me and parchment are the hardest to preserve. Is what follows next in terms of not just the temperature, but for here is the mold, and then with um, soiling or dirt, or even if I did nothing, the, beyond the bacteria, the, whatever, it changed. Is this some project you're doing that you're describing? I, I do um, various expressions, not just the gardening, mm -hmm. but I make a lot, uh, like, Painting, just like an art object, object like an art object, okay. and part of it originally started with all these photographs I had collected, and then I got into I wanted to I, have to, uh, I can laugh about it now, but leave something for memory, mm -hmm. and so then it was arranging the photographs, and I thought I can't really write <coughs> I can write a story. But the story, there's no way to capture it to make this permanent. And that ties back for me in terms of I'm looking at you know, that process yeah. where everything is changing or deteriorating. And when I look at, you know, beyond museums and paintings, mm -hmm. is the realization that I'm seeing it now, yeah. Yeah. but it's not permanent. Now you see uh, that very clearly in the art of schizophrenics and in uh, Van Gogh's work, where you can see he's trying to capture something which is moving so fast he can't capture it. You know, and the pain is barely keeping up. <laughs> and then when you look at it, it looks vibrant, like it's 
in motion. I think that was part of Van Gogh's insanity, you know, so to speak, or his neurosis, that he was trying to capture something. He was having some sort of um, experience. And his, he was a visionary, or he, he saw things differently. But to try to capture it in a medium that is by definition static, right? very difficult. Very difficult. So impermanence, that's a principle of Buddhism. And you see a lot of conceptual artists these days working in the medium in such a way that it is ephemeral. It doesn't last. It disappears. You know, they create things. That's what we're talking about, events. Events are the most complex. So they're concept art. You know, people are doing things which you have to be there because they're not going to be there. There's no record, no document. Of course, any live performance is like that. Here we are recording a live thing. <laughs> Is it clear on that? Anything else? Yes. Uh, no, not at the moment. The other thing is, um, beyond reading, beyond reading or whatever is occurring, is for the, is, my thought has been, not just when I read um, what the book and what has been translated multiple times now, now we have this, but is it worked it through my confusion about I thought that quote my practice should in some way emulate or or be expressed. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm trying to. This is where I got. I, I sort of got a clue that my practice was to be somebody else's practice, mm -hmm. and I thought oh, I'm missing the whole point. <laughs> the whole point is that's impossible. Yeah. And my practice is. Acknowledging where I am or what my experience is in this present moment, mm -hmm. that is the practice. Yeah. Some people are very, some comments are very cynical almost, you might say. People say you're just lapping up other people's leftovers. <laughs> <coughs> you know, read your own book kind of thing. But, you know, this, this goes against one of even Dogen's own teachings where he would say, people want to say the Dharma is not in the written record. He said, but that is also the Dharma. There isn't anything outside the Dharma. And so these are all, admittedly, uh, people trying to use language to point out something which is not capturable in language. And so the great ones, like Dogen, are able to use language and not be used by it. So that they... Like, for instance, a very simple example, in Fukan Zazengi, he says, when he gets into the instructions part, sitting upright, he says, lean neither to the front, nor to the back, nor to the left, nor to the right. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tell you what to do, he tells you what not to do. And this goes to the point that I think is very critical for us, that I can tell if I'm leaning to the right, I can tell if I'm leaning to the left, I can tell if I'm leaning back or tell if I'm leaning forward, I can feel it. Mm -hmm. If you sit long enough, uh, Still enough. One long retreat at Okamura, she's nine o'clock at night on one of the last nights. I'm sitting there and I lean over and I hear I lean the other way. I lean forward. I lean back. You can actually hear the motor muscles kicking in. <laughs> when you're in the middle, it's you got about an inch of leeway there, or half inch on either side. They don't. No, the muscles are, you know, in balance. But if you lean one way, the muscles on that side start kicking in because you're stretching. <laughs> so, Master Token says, lean, lean either to the front, let's do back to the left or right. Uh, and um, when you sit still enough, long enough, you can actually tell when you are in equilibrium. You can tell when your, your body is in equilibrium. Um, and that's a critical point. We know when we're off balance. We know when we're daydreaming. You know. We know when we're worrying about something. We know when we're planning for this afternoon. We know that. We can recognize it. And so that is the mental jujitsu that is the secret of Zen. It's not that we can attain anything or find, you know, the perfect posture. We can find 
enlightenment. It's that we can see when we are leading ourselves away from it. We can definitely see it. And so we just stop doing that. As I said yesterday, uh, you know, you go through these four levels of, uh, or five levels, actually I didn't say this, this is something that Corey and I talked about, Stephen and I talked about, Dobson. There's one formula for creativity uh, that I came up with, and it actually comes from mathematics. But I began to see that every creative process, from writing a book, to doing a painting, to doing a design project, goes through these same phases. And the first one is called Excuse Me, and the next one is My, and then Dear Aunt Sally. Anybody ever heard that? Excuse Me, My Dear Aunt Sally? Justin, tell us what that is. It's the order of operations. <coughs> the order of oper mathematical operations to solve a quadratic equation, or I guess any other kind. If you do them out of order, you get the wrong answer. If you don't do the exponents first, solve the exponents first. So it's exponents, multiply, divide, add, subtract. And it occurred to me if you write a book, or if you, anything else you do, the exponent is what's under the radical, what's the root, what's the root of the problem, what's the root of the issue, why are we even doing this? You can apply this to Zen too. Why do we even do this? So the exponent, the x, is, is the mystery, is the zero dimension, is the concept, right? the idea, the urge, the arousing of the Bodhi mind, the aspiration to the Bodhi mind. M means multiply. Multiply in design is brainstorming and writing a book, it would be doing the mind map or the outline, getting everything out there that you think you might want to write about, right? It's going to be part of this, whatever this book is you're writing, whatever this project you're doing, multiply. In design, we work on whiteboards and put paper on the wall, and somebody has a pen, and everybody just, it's non judgmental. Nobody crit critiques any ideas here. You just throw it up there, and somebody's writing it down as fast as they can. But finally, you have this mess on the wall that it's called, it's called a mosaic because it doesn't have any form. The next stage is you do a division. So you take that, and you start, assuming it's complete, everybody thinks, I don't have any more ideas. Then you start dividing that into groupings. You say, this kind of goes with this over here because they're all the same kind of thing. So we put red circles around those and you know you go through an analysis of what you've already done. You divide it up into sensible groupings. Right? The next thing you do is you, and in this case it would be your chapters, it would be the way you're putting your, right, you're reducing your mind map to, you know, coherence. Then the next thing you do is you look at each of those and you add to them to flesh them out to see if each category is complete, you know, or you're missing some things. But the last thing you do is subtract. The last thing you do is always subtract. You subtract by getting rid of all the stuff that, you know, like just editing, editing and subtracting. You mostly, you know, they say when you write a manuscript, you want to go back in and take at least 40% of it out before you ever submit it to a publisher. Because 40% of it is going to be like junk DNA, you know. <laughs> it's going to be the stuff in between the good stuff. So uh, that particular process, I think, relates to Zen. And that when we come to Zen, it's all multiplication. We're coming here, the exponent, another radical, you know. Each of us has a different root problem. We're coming in here, we think Zen has something for it that can help. But if we talk to you, talk to you, and you, and you, and you, me, it all be different, right? The reason we're coming in the door. But then the first thing that happens is it's multiplied. It's very busy. It's very uh, disturbing. It's very confusing. Uh, you know, it's simple, as we said before. But we're complicated. We bring all the baggage in with us, right? From from outside. So we're sitting here, and we, our mind just goes berserk, and we, we, we can't settle down and be zen-like, right? Uh, we keep trying. Interestingly enough, multiply uh, starts with the same initial as monkey. <laughs> the monkey mind is just oh, chatter, 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 chatter. <laughs> that's uh, unfortunately that's multiply in, in Zen. So we have two way too many ideas about it. So then we begin uh, dividing it up into things like how it is on the cushion, how it is off the cushion, right? Uh, when I'm at the Zendo, I'm an angel. When I'm at work, I'm a jerk. <laughs> you know, when I'm at home, I'm fighting with my family when I come here, I'm so nice. So we begin having this fundamental schizophrenic division of personality into at least two, right? Jekyll and Hyde, and maybe many, many more. So uh, 
we have to begin dividing up our experience and go, well, how, does the how does this stuff he's saying fit into what happens on the cushion, right? All those things. We have Sangha practice. We divide it this way. We have Sangha practice. We have community, right? That's all of this. We practice and we rub our, each other's rough edges off, as one of my teachers said. Most difficult form of practice. Uh, the most difficult dharma is dharma relationships, marriage, you know, a family. That's the most difficult. So all that sticky, sticky stuff. Uh, dharma practice, dharma study, that's simpler, but it's complex, it's confusing. You're more on your own, it's cleaner in a sense. And Buddha is experience on the cushion, right? So how does Buddha practice on the cushion relate to dharma study, relate to community practice? So we have those divisions, right? So we can see how we can divide it up and try to, you know, grow up with it. Then, addition would be, you know, have I read enough? Have I read the right stuff? You know, have I, have I studied all the things I need to study? I still don't seem to understand anything. Is, there, is it written down somewhere something that's going to help me, right? So you begin to think, how can I fill in these categories? We put together uh, practice path prerequisites for the formal path, and they they involve you know prerequisites for Buddha practice. How much time on the cushion? How many retreats? How long? You know, over how many period of years before you can become this or that, and eventually become transmitted so as in priest. It's about a twelve year program, like a PhD. Then we have a big bibliography for reading, and we recommend starting with the current people moving back to Japan, moving back to China, and finally back to India. Don't start in India. You know, the way everything is expressed there through all the translations and stuff is so weird that it's going to confuse you. But by the time you get to India, if you go back backwards in time, historically, you will encounter ideas written in the Indian text that you have heard in more modern contexts from Chinese teachers, Japanese teachers, you know, Western teachers, and so on. And so we say, oh, that's what they're talking about. It's not as, as weird as it sounds, right? So we can divide it up a lot, a lot of different ways. And we can add to each category. So if you're sitting and you say, well, I have daily practice. I sit at home and go to the Zendo once a week. Maybe I'll go to a session. Maybe I'll go you know, five days. Maybe I'll go to a long, maybe I'll go to a 90-day envelope. So you're adding in the category of Buddha practice. Right? But then at the end, this is what we talked about reinventing Zen. All of us have to reinvent Zen. You really have to start subtracting the stuff that doesn't work. You know? And you have to give up your attachments to maybe some of the protocols that you really like. You know, uh, If you insist on having incense burning, there's some people who are asthmatic, and you got to fight with them about the incense. Well, you're supposed to burn incense. Again, if you go back in history, you're sitting in basically an uninsulated, no HVAC, no windows. Of course, they're burning incense, but you know, you'd be lucky to get a whiff of it. You know, because the wind is roaring through the place. <laughs> so, again, <laughs> we take this idea and we translate it into a must do, a cultural meme, cast in concrete. This is how we're supposed to do it. And everybody's suffocating from incense and getting, right, getting diseases. So subtract. Subtracting at the end in Zen is just as uh, critical and the most difficult process as it is in any other uh, work of art. Well, I went on with that one, didn't I? <coughs> I need to subtract more. Hmm. If you think about it, our way of practice, Zazen, in the, in the arts, we say there are additive processes and there are subtractive processes, generally speaking. There are also forgiving media and unforgiving media. It's another thing we could talk about. So if you want to make a bust uh, statue, you can build an armature and add clay. Right? It's all little, 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 little. At the end, you may scrape some off and smooth it down and so forth. Or you can take a hunk of stone, like Rodin, and chip away until you leave what is the sculpture. So the first process is considered additive in an obvious sense, and the second one is considered subtractive in an obvious sense. They both end up with a sculpture. And it could even be the same sculpture, the same bust of the same person. 
But Zen, I think, uh, we come to Zen and we think, <coughs> what am I going to gain, you know, my attaining idea? What am I going to get out of it? Uh, and the answer is basically nothing. Uh, I had a, we had a very active prison program for a long time in Atlanta, and I would go down to the federal pen. And w one of the chaplains there who would let us in and walk us out was this really tall Catholic priest, you know, pretty young guy. Seemed very serious and down to earth and everything. And we were walking out one day. It's a long walk from the back of the prison compound to the front gate. And he's saying, "Well, uh, you know, I have we have our meditation and and uh, Catholicism, the priesthood, and so forth. What, what would I get out of out of Zen meditation?" I said, "I don't know that you'd get anything, but you might lose something." <laughs> That's interesting. So the idea, you know, that occurred to him then is maybe I'm carrying something around with me. <laughs> you know? So when we sit in Zen, uh, part of what we have to subtract is the baggage we bring in here. All of our preconceptions about it, all of our ideas. And um, it, it ultimately, you know, it's translated into terms like ignorance. We, ignorance is clouding our vision. And Matsuoka Roshi would say things like, uh, you expect a lightning bolt out of the sky, it's more like clouds parting to reveal the sun. Well, you can think of those clouds as the kind of mental confusion, etc., ignorance that we bring to the process, right? But the process of that clearing up is natural. It just takes time. And it's not something we can force and make happen. So, I think we're about out of time. It's 10.25. Is that good? So let's go around the room and see. We'll do one more exercise, but let's see if we have any questions, comments. Uh, no. Um, in terms of breaking, we talked a little bit yesterday about uh, breaking from conditioning mm -hmm. and how uh, we've been conditioned <coughs> into a certain point. And part of creativity, in any respect, is calling into question those conditions. Um, keeping that in mind, it, uh, and then also this idea of it being a slow process, um, how do we go about uh, questioning the conditioning that we've been raised with? Well, when you say breaking, and how do we go about doing it, uh, you know, you're already implying assertive activity, acts of commission, that we will do this and do this and do this. And that's, what, <coughs> that's how we're trying to think. So, um, again, with the Catholic priest, it may be an act of omission, you know. Um, one of my teacher's metaphors for the mind is when we try that way, we're like trying to grasp incense smoke. And the smoke evades the grasp. But if you stop trying to grasp and leave your palm open, the smoke embraces your palm. So our approach is not to try to do this because it cannot be done. We call it undoing or non-doing. We call it unlearning, or unlearning. Uh, we approach non-thinking, as we said in the poem, or recited, actualized within non-thinking. The actualization is by nature intimate. What could be more intimate than non-thinking? There's not even thinking going on, right? So there's no, there's none of that activity. So it's very intimate. To get to that point, we have to stop our knee-jerk reaction to everything that we usually do, and that's the subtraction part. We recognize it. There I go again. You know, I see myself daydreaming again, worrying again. Some teachers, myself included, for creating people such as yourself, uh, we recommend you keep a notepad next to where you sit. So when you're sitting and you become very clear emotionally, mentally, and so forth, uh, eureka ideas, or, you know, aha moments can occur that are related, say, to the projects you're working on, even though you're not consciously thinking about them. So at that time, you start to worry about, oh, that's, that's great, that's what I have to do, that. I have to remember that. Right? I don't want to forget that. So we suggest just jogging it down. You know, I'm a designer, so sometimes I'll even do a little sketch. <laughs> you know, because it, it occurred to me, that's the way to make that joint. You know? uh, get back to it later. Keywords. It's not that you sit there and write a book, obviously. And then that allows you to get back to sitting. So it does two things. It relieves you of the burden of mulling over and 
you know, chewing your cud and trying to remember that. And it also raises the question, then what am I getting back to if it's not that? Right? So it's not important to try to answer that question, what are you getting back to? But it's important to nurture it and to continue raising that question. What are we getting back to here? What is this? So I think it's a good technique because it sets that aside back to this. You shouldn't keep your life out of your practice. But our practice is not therapy for figuring out our life. In many ways, it's beyond figuring out. So that's one of the things you kind of have to subtract the idea that Zen is going to make you a better person. <coughs> Zen is going to change things in your life, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those are some of the deep-seated wishes you know, that we have that we have to subtract. When they come up, you say, well, there it is again. Okay, let that one go. Comes up again, there it is again. There's another one around. Make sense? Yeah. Oh, on one hand, lots and lots and lots of questions. On the other hand, no. Well, everybody can follow up by Skype. You all have my contact information. If not, who one has it. And uh, we can continue this dialogue. And we'll be continuing Tuesday nights with the Skype conferences. So I hope you'll be turned there. Justin. Uh, two things. One, I made a hike uh, last night. Can you hold it to for a minute? Yeah. Um, and the order of operations is please excuse my dear and Sally. Maybe correct this. Excuse me, page. excuse me, my dear and Sally. XMDAS. X Madas. X Christmas with a D in it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Your name again is? Caroline. Caroline. Uh, do you use um, or how, do you use dreams? Well, depends on what you mean by use. Tell me more about what you mean by use. Do you become informed by your, with your dreams? Do you use how do you use your dreams, or do you use them at all? Uh, if you're interested in that, there's a book that Dalai Lama published. It was a conversation he had with some medical people about sleeping, dreaming, and dying, and he talked about the parallels between them from the Tibetan. Uh, perspective. They're a little more mystical than we are in Zen. In Zen we say, uh, like a dream, like a fantasy. This is a dream. This is like a dream, like a fantasy. So the dividing line between waking and dreaming and Zen is very thin. Very thin. It's, it's, it's diminishingly small. Eventually it disappears. One night, sitting at a long retreat, uh, I was suddenly in a dream. And the people in the dream had a clipboard and they'd written on it and they were holding it in front of me for me to read the clipboard. I was trying very hard to read what they'd written on the clipboard. And the next instant, I was still trying to read the clipboard, but it's embedded in the Zendo wall. <laughs> so, the line is just that thin. There are some experiments that have been done where they put uh, video uh, into the book <coughs> and the person can actually see the video here flowing in the air in front of the rest of what we're seeing. So dream, uh, dream state, this state, are said to be inseparable. Uh, they're somewhat distinctly different. We can tell the difference again. If we can tell when we're daydreaming, we can tell when we're planning and worrying and so forth. And we all woke up this morning, uh, and we know the difference between what it was to be asleep, and what it is that we call being awake, right? So Buddhism's proposition is like that. It's very similar, very simple, that we're still asleep. And we can wake up from this, and we will just as clearly know the difference. So Buddha means fully awakened one, and he was awake. He saw everybody else sleepwalking, or like in a zombie state. He was the only one awake in the room and he could see the difference. So that's the way I think dream fits into What is the name of the book the Dalai Lama wrote on that subject? Sleeping, Dreaming, and Dying. I'll remember, thank you. Yeah. And the process of dying is uh, tied very close, clearly into the process of sleeping, going to sleep. 
Okay. Show off. Betsy. Donna. My mind and body are tired. But I'd like to say my favorite haiku. Can you hold it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hold that for a moment? We're all going to say one. Okay. And your name? Uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, yes. First time, yeah. it's a dose. Mm -hmm. It's a different way of thinking, it's non-thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Hope you come back. Okay. I won't be here next time. I just let people be <laughs> different. I just uh, would like to say that my practice is one of continually letting go. Noticing and letting go. Noticing and letting go. And uh, many of the students that practice here will find that that seems overwhelming and frustrating. Yeah. Uh, as the, will it ever end? And I, the practice is beginningless and endless. And, and uh, I am at a place now where letting go is joyous. It, that there's a freeing up of space in the mind when we let go of our habit patterns uh, that are the clouds that seemingly hinder the blue sky. <laughs> Somebody might question, what's the point? You know, so what? I mean, where does that lead to? But uh, we say awakening, you know, is a process. It's, enlightenment is considered a state. But we're the no enlightenment school. So the process of awakening is like that. It's continuous, continuously moving. Okay, so um, I had one exercise for you. Uh, we know, um, and this is the last one, right? 10.30 we have until... We're usually done at 10.30. Uh, we have to eat and a little bit early. wait for our service. Okay. Well, let's wrap this up. Um, what I was going to do is uh, what I did at the SCBA, which is where we chanted Tisarana, and then those who are musical sang on top of it, improvised. Are there any mus musical singers here that people like to sing? I mean, really like to sing? Feel like they can? It's just you and I. We're not going to do it. We could. We could. Uh, everybody else just chants, okay? But it's different. It's um, are you pretty good at rhythm? Uh, I've never been a drummer. Uh, <laughs> so you're blind. I'm pretty good at rhythm. If you want to use the Makubia. Yeah, it's uh, what it is is uh, waltz time. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two.
Sure. You comfortable with that? Let him do it. So you can free yourself up to sing. Okay. But I'm sad. have to research this issue and get back to you later. <laughs> that was very good. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Pinzo in attendant in kitchen. Pinzo and attendant. 
cooking food in the kitchen. Yummy, let's eat. <laughs> Close. <laughs> well, it's very good food. You have one done? I have my favorite one. Okay, what's your favorite? The mountains speak the eloquence of silence. And who's that from? Did you have time, Jennifer? Um, no. <laughs> come back to me. Is okay. it syllables or words? Syllables. So, five, twelve, five. Syllables. Five, twelve, five, 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 seven, five. I mean, sorry, five, seven, five. Syllables. There are peas on... Peas are on the vine. Squash blossoms are shining in the sun. The creative mind is nowhere to be found yet, and it never was. I know when I was driving through Florida, making, let's see, thousands of Buddhas driving through, I don't know, something, something. My compassionate windshield. <laughs> Making thousands of books. <laughs> okay, we're back to you. Uh, it's five seven and five. Okay. I do not know where I am going, but I will. Decide. Put an apostrophe in there, that's good. <laughs> to <coughs> sit here now. Now. Now, now. That's not good. Yep. Yep. Real um, quick. <laughs> um, as I sit here now. <laughs> <laughs> 